While I was in the Esteli region for my service, one of my friends was working in a small village in Matagalba. He came into the country at the same time I did, and we both worked in the agricultural group. While my work was more focused on animals and improving methods of caring for and killing said animals, he was working to organize community banks and even manage to build the much needed bridge in his village. While I am all right with divulging my name, I do not feel the same way about giving away his personal information so freely. For that reason, I will call him by the nickname he earned in his community, Boots. While not the most awesome nickname ever, it was fairly original. He was awarded that nickname because when we all arrived in Nicaragua, we had a two-month period of training. During this time, he visited a boot maker and had an amazing pair made. The boots were apparently so resplendent that his entire community was angling to try and get them from him before he returned home to the United States. The community wanted his boots so badly that a few of the guys began calling him Boots and the name just stuck. This is a small aside, but I feel like it needs to be said. Boots is a great guy and I am privileged to call him one of my friends. While he was in Nicaragua, he lived in a small community in Matagalba. While La Quinta was located along a stretch of road an hour or so away from Esteli, he lived in a more mountainous region this had its benefits and drawbacks. He wouldn't have to deal with missionary groups, whom, if I may attach another small side note, missionaries are some of the worst people I have ever met in my life. Surprise visits from the bosses were a non-existent problem for him. The major drawback he experienced was his transportation. If he wanted to get into Matagalba, he had to wake up at 4 a.m. and walk to the bus stop to catch a 7 a.m. bus to his closest city. From there it was a five-hour trip into Matagalba. From Matagalba, it took an additional five hours to reach Managua. Managua, by the way, was where the Peace Corps building was located and the Nicaraguan capital also happened to have the only hospital we were allowed to visit. This, of course, was worrisome, and it would become very problematic for him later. Boot spent a lot of his time in Nicaragua taking pictures and working in his community. He was always working in his sector. One of his biggest ways of relaxing after a hard day of work was through music. He had brought an iPod with him with a gigantic high-class set of headphones that looked more like earmuffs. He would put on those headphones every night and drown out the sounds of the wildlife and community around him. It was about six months into Boots' service that he began to hear the noises. He described it like this. Pick up two or three rocks or pieces of gravel and begin rubbing them together in your hands. The sound you would hear from the stones grinding together was almost the exact same sound he began to hear that day. One day he woke up to that sound. At first he assumed it was the sound of construction. He thought that somewhere in his community someone was building a new house and that was the source of the omnipresent, but almost inaudible sound. Boots ignored the sound for most of the day, assuming that it was just people at work. When he went to lay down that night and he was still hearing those sounds, he began to have his doubts. No one could possibly be working that long and that late at night. He decided to check it out the next morning as there wasn't much he could do that night. He popped on his headphones, turned up his music, 
and went to bed. The next morning, Boots went around his community and asked if there was anyone building anything. No one was doing any construction in his community. So, after turning down a number of offers to trade his boots for a chicken or a pig, he went back to his house. By now the sound had grown louder, but was only a minor annoyance. He said at this time that it was no louder than the whirring of a computer monitor or the oscillating sounds that come from a fan. Boots assume that the sound might be his eardrums popping due to the altitude he lived at. He was tempted to go into Managua and talk with one of the doctors, but he ultimately decided against it. It was a two-part trip that would take two days to get him into the capital. It was a lot of work for something that he was certain would pass. The next day, was a Sunday and by now the nose had grown exponentially. He described the volume as being the equivalent of someone rubbing rocks around just inches away from his ear. Now Boos was concerned. Unfortunately, the transportation system didn't work on the weekend. He would have to wait a day to get into the nearest city. The next day, the sound was almost completely gone. He was relieved at first until he tilted his head and he felt a liquid substance trickling out of his ear. It was straw-colored and smelled like earwax. He walked down to the bus stop and began the arduous process of getting into Managua. He missed the last bus to Managua and had to spend the night in Matagalba. By the time he made it into Managua, Boots' left ear was inflamed. He went into the Peace Corps' office and got a doctor's appointment. The doctor asked if he would be all right with waiting a day, and he told her right to her face that he wasn't going to wait. She was nonplussed about his insistence, but she had him sit down on an examination table. The doctor pulled out an otoscope and they examined right ear, and then his left. When she looked into his left ear, she gasped and said these words exactly, Sangre de Cristo, which translates to blood of Christ or Christ's blood. She dropped the otoscope, and when he asked her what she saw, she told him that when she looked into his ear canal, she saw insect plagues. Apparently, the insect had crawled into the lining of his headphones one day, enticed by the residual smell of earwax. When he went to bed that night and put on his headphones, the insect was driven out of the headphone lining by the vibrations of the music and into the safest spot it could find his ear canal. That night, it locked its pinchers mandibles into his ear where it stayed for over for days. You may find yourself asking what the bug was doing those for days and wondering about the nose that sounded like rocks being rubbed together. There is a simple answer to both of those inquiries. The sound Boots had been hearing was the bug chewing its way th through his eardrum and worming its way deeper into his head.